This is something you and I have talked about a bit in the past, but let's come back to it. We saw this huge Sturman drawing, if I can call it that, down there in Washington. The media loves to cover it. But did, any, did anything happen that really matters this week in Washington mm -hmm. when it comes to the deficit? Not really. It was a farce. I mean, Sturman drawing is probably even too much. <laughs> Uh, I think the big story or the big drama really is the deficit and debt. We have high and rising debt to GDP ratios, and that was completely ignored in this drama, but really needs to become front and center. Well, and that's a problem that Democrats and Republicans share. That's not by no, that's no, not partisan No, no, absolutely. If all. you ask yourself, bad math, the Democrat and Republican parties have no plan, and the president has no leadership, what could go wrong? <laughs> well, a lot, uh, particularly when you count in the need for higher defense spending, spending on opportunity, and particularly in the context of today's jobs reports, higher interest rates and what they do to the budget. So what about the math? You refer to the math. What's the math as opposed to the policy differences before we get to the policies? Well, the math is the debt to GDP ratio is on an unsustainable path, meaning we just can't go there. And we can fight about how to address it. That's a reason for legitimate political discourse. But denying that it's a problem is not. And we can't say that we won't raise any tax or cut any spending. There's no door number three. When do we really start to feel the pain? Because part of the problem is we keep hearing about this drama, and then it goes away and nothing quite happens. And so at some point, it's sort of like the boy that cried wolf, right? We're going to feel it very soon. And it's easy to see why. We need to spend much more on defense. Interest rates have gone up and have really thrown the federal budget into uh, a problem. In fact, if interest rates stay where they are now, premium over what the CBO forecast over the next decade, well, about a seven percentage point increase in the debt to GDP ratio, even over bad numbers, and about $3 trillion more debt. We really can't go there. So what's the solution? Give us the answer to it. Uh, again, apart from exactly what the policies are, but how do we start on a path that actually addresses the we, issue? You know, it's a great question. I, I think the problem is we can't go to the Congressional Budget Office's long-term outlook and start pulling out technocratic proposals. That's not going to work. We first have to tell the American people what's going on. Actual information. Here's the path. Here's how bad it is. Here's what it's going to do to programs you care about, like the ability to defend the country, educate children, do basic research. And then we have to start articulating stories. You know, what kinds of policies make sense? Do we have a tax system that works? Do we want Social Security and Medicare to be as generous as they are now for upper income people? We have to have those discussions. And then finally, we have to talk about gradual adjustment. No serious person thinks we're going to slam on the brakes today. But how do we, like the Greenspan Commission decades ago, outline something steadily that could make a difference? Who's the we? We live in a democracy, uh, and votes count, uh, political appeal accounts. I assume you're talking about some political leadership that has to really take the bull by the horns. Yes. I mean, obviously, the president should be leading. He's not. I would hope that in the presidential campaign, we will see this. My desire would be to have a fiscal commission begin after the election, the 2024 election, to really tackle these issues, and whoever's president, to take that very seriously. Lest you think it's naive, we have plenty of precedents for doing this, and frankly, anything that tries to move faster just isn't politically viable. Tell us about the commission. As you say, it's been done before, uh, with respect to Social Security, as I recall, also base closings. I yes, done and those with. are the two issues. So Social Security had a cash flow problem. President Reagan appointed a commission. Alan Greenspan chaired it. And that commission came up with a politically palatable idea of gradual changes that affected both taxes and spending. I think the same thing has to happen here. We have to ask ourselves, do we have the right tax system? Hint, we don't. Mm. Let's fix that. Uh, do we have the right structure of the entitlements? Hint, we don't. And how do we gradually change those to bring the budget back? In the past, when you use a commission, is it basically because both sides know where they need to get to, they just need to have a way to do it without paying too much of a price? And do the sides right now have that same understanding? I think they do. I think nobody wants to admit it. Right now, we have a bipartisan consensus that taxes should not be raised except on the very rich, and no spending should be cut. That fails math. Where are we with Social Security? Uh, Social Security is actually relatively straightforward to fix. We have to ask ourselves a fundamental question. What do we want it to do? Uh, if we want Social Security to make sure no senior is in poverty, we should raise minimum benefits and then flatten them for everyone else. 
Raising the retirement age is, is something to consider, although one would want to make sure it doesn't bind on people who do a lot of physical labor as opposed to people who do more office labor. But this one isn't hard economically. It's just politically difficult. Is there any way to get to real deficit reform without dealing with Social Security and Medicare? No, no. In fact, if you say, let's just fix this by raising taxes on the rich, if you did all of the tax increases on the rich that might be plausible, you might be talking about a percentage point of GDP. That's real money, but not compared to the size of the deficit that we're talking about. You really have to tackle the entitlement program. Uh, is there any way to deal with the deficit problem without doing both revenue and costs? No, no. I think revenue has to be part of the uh, equation for two reasons. One is political, but the other is timing. If you believe that you need gradual adjustment in the spending side on entitlements, you'll need more revenue up front. So candidates, I think, would include, let's say, a carbon tax or a reform in the tax system that allows you to raise more revenue without killing jobs and growth. Both of those are possible. So, so you have to deal with Medicare, you have to deal with Social Security, and you have to do with both revenue increases, which is taxes, essentially, and you have to deal with costs. But does feathering it in help? Uh, if you look back in history, does it make a difference if you sort of, we're not going to do it right away, we're going to do it over a period of time? Well, it absolutely does for two reasons. One, it's not a large change in any given year. And second, it gives people time to plan. If you're going to adjust entitlements, you're telling younger people, you have time, we'll give you other ways to save. Likewise, on tax increases, we're not punishing today's job creators and businesses. We're trying to phase in the need to pay for what the American people say they want. Glenn, you've been in Washington as well as here in, in, in New York. Have we had instances where the president has come forward and done that education that you say is the first step? Because right now, I think most people don't really understand what's going on. Well, we most definitely have. Uh, if you take, for example, President Reagan's leadership, on tax reform, a complicated subject to be sure. He made sure the American people understood what was going on. Uh, in a controversial issue, George H.W. Bush, in explaining a budget deal, explained well, I think, why both sides had to make compromises. He paid a political price, but it was the right thing to do. So are there people working on this right now? Can you, can you are you working on it? I mean, uh, how do we I get I am and lots of people are. This is not a problem that is technically difficult. The trick is to come up with things that can build political coalitions and processes that make it happen. This is not something where Republicans get everything they want or Democrats get everything they want. Both sides will have to make concessions, but the math is the math. We're here on Wall Street Week. Is there a role that Wall Street, in a largely uh, construed, Wall Street can play to try to bring this to pass? 100%. This past week, I think Jamie Dimon had made comments about elevated interest rates from policy. Business leaders have made comments that the uncertainty and chaos in Washington is affecting economic growth and governance fears for interest rates in the economy. It is perfectly okay, and I would hope necessary, for business leaders to stand up. And how do we explain to individuals across the country what it means for them individually? Because everyone, when they hear this, the first question would be, what does it mean for me? Town halls. Go back to the Bowles Simpson Commission. Uh, Alan Simpson was an enormous comedian around <laughs> the country in explaining things. Erskine Bowles, less funny, but super smart and, and uh, very sincere. We need that. We need going around the country explaining what's going on. Finally, though, you have hopes that maybe this will come up as an issue in this election? Because I haven't seen evidence of it yet. I think it will, uh, not because economists have suddenly become persuasive, but because of things like the need for defense, the higher interest rates, the uncertainty, the Federal Reserve policy, the jobs report today. That's what's going to keep it in the news.